Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Jay and welcome to Simple Church Online. Whether you missed last Sunday, you're checking us out for the first time, or maybe even watching out of state, we're so glad that you're a part of our community. And we're praying today that as you watch, God would use this to bless your life. Enjoy the message. Man, I've been praying a ton for this series, for this message, for the people who would be sitting in the seats and, and just asking God to, to be so real and so true in these moments. Because we've been talking a lot about walking through the valley. And one of the things that's difficult as a pastor when you're dealing with, with a lot of circumstances that we, we have to deal with, with losing people, with, with talking about battling certain diseases and cancer and, and, and people being sick, it, 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 you're kind of inundated with it over and over and over again. And your encouragement, because I believe it with all of my heart, is that God is good even through the storm. The encouragement is that, that God sees the other side of this and God, uh, you know, he's, he's in control and all these things. And I believe all of these things I, with, from the depth of my core, and I will always say them. But there's this human side of me that when we, when we see people walking through these things, it feels like so little to say that to them. It almost sometimes feels like a slap in the face to say, hey, God's in control. I know that you're losing that person but God's in control. And it can be really difficult to try to, in, to try to assure people in those moments of pain that God's got this, right? But it's, it's, it's true or it's not. I, I said this last week or the week before. Either it's real or it's not. And so my job as a Christ follower and as a pastor is to speak the truth over the situation that even in the valley, God is in control. And as tough as that may be, I believe it to the core of my being. And so we're going to continue with this Psalm 23 series that we've been in and taking a look at what David actually meant as a shepherd walking through this. And, and uh, we've got the, the New King James Version of Psalm 23. And I would love for us, I'm not going to make you stand today, it's a, it's a cold rainy day, so I'll let you sit and, and relax. But I would love for us to say this together as a church. I, what, what my hope is by the end of the series that you can, you can quote mo most of Psalm 23 or that it's in your heart enough that when moments come up, you can bring this to light. And so I'd like for us to say it together. It'll be on the screen here with us. Let's begin. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So if you've been with us, this is week 10. We've been going through 10 weeks of Psalm 23. And one of the things I love about it, we debated about, is this going to be too long of a series? Are people going to get bored? Is it going to be redundant? What I love is that we can take 10 separate weeks to look at eight verses of Scripture or whatever it is, right? That's, there's so much depth to what God has given us, so much truth to what God has given us that we could, we could have probably taken 18, 20 weeks on this series. And so we just have a couple weeks left. But today we're going to talk about the beginning part of verse 6. And it says this, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, in studying this, a lot of commentaries and a lot of things that I had read talk about a banquet feast because that comes up uh, over and over again in, in Scripture. And it's, it's a picture of heaven that, that we're invited to the banquet, to the feast, and those who reject the message of Christ will be outside of the feast. And so a lot of people say, well, what, what this is saying is, is God is going to prepare a big feast uh, in front of David's enemies. And, and he'll be able to, to sit and eat while his, his uh, enemies watch him and, and are sad that they're not at the feast. And I can see how people get there, but it, that seems like a weird spot whenever we've just been talking about walking through the valley and how God is taking care of us. And so I've really enjoyed this book by uh, Philip Keller that talks about what does it actually look like to be a shepherd. He was a shepherd and a pastor, and so he had a unique perspective on what he actually was saying in these passages. And so we've been talking about going through the valley, and going through the valley for a shepherd is when they would take their sheep on a long trek for summer. They would take them through the valley to the mountain 
mountaintop to, to find new grazing area for the summer and then come back for the winter. Well, the places that they would take these sheep were called mesas. If you know, if you took Spanish 101, then you know mesa means table, and they also call it the table land. And so they would take these sheep on this journey, and they would ultimately reach this, this plateau, this table land, where they would graze for the summer. And so, uh, with David having that in mind, that makes more sense to me. It follows the shepherd path that we've been talking about, about what, what David's been talking about, the shepherd taking us through. But something would happen prior to uh, the shepherd taking the sheep to this table, to this mesa. The shepherd would go by himself to prepare the way. He would go and begin to check out, okay, what's going on? Where's the best place for us to go? Where I want to make sure everything's ready for when we take this trek because th- this was a long trek and, and you want to make sure that things are ready when you get there. And so there were a couple of reasons that the shepherd would go before the sheep to make sure things were ready. And obviously in our life, it correlates to what God does for us. And so I want to talk about those three things. But I think there's something more than that that jumps out to me about this verse. The first thing that they would do, and this was the most important, is they would go to this area and they would see if there were any poisonous weeds, berries, flowers, anything like that, because sheep, as we've been talking about, not the smartest animals, right? They're dumb. That's why we're called sheep, because we're dumb. Let's just be honest with ourselves, right? And so they would go and they they would search the land and they would spend a ton of time picking all these poisonous things because sheep have a natural habit of being drawn to them. Uh, Philip Keller talks about being young as a shepherd and, and learning this, that there were, there were blue and white camas flowers, and they're, they're very bright flowers. And so, of course, the sheep were like, oh, pretty flower, let me go eat that. Well, if a you, a, a little baby, ate a couple of the white camas flowers, it would be dead within a few hours. It was that potent of stuff. But ewes especially would always go, or, or uh, baby lambs would always go to those and, and want to eat them. So it was the, the shepherd's job to make sure we got rid of all that stuff. The same is true in our life, right? We are so drawn to things and the next shiny thing and the next thing that we think is going to bring happiness and joy. And so we just kind of naturally as humans are drawn to these things. And so God does what he does by removing some of those things out of our lives, the weeds from our life. And here's, here's what I found in my life, that This far along in my journey as a Christ follower, I'm pretty good at noticing the poisonous weeds. Like, that looks bad. I shouldn't do that, right? There's the list of things that I'm like, that's not going to be, that's not going to end good. I'm not going to do that. But it's the poisonous flowers and berries that I think we get mixed up in, right? It doesn't look bad, right? It's just... It's just a little bit of a busy schedule, but I'm, I'm spending time with my kids. You know, I'm, you know we, we haven't been at church, but it's just, it, it, we, it's, this is life. This is how sports are now. And I'm not bashing sports. We did this our whole life, please. But th- this is what I'm talking about with those flowers and those berries, right? They don't look bad, but we're drawn to them, and God wants to remove those things that will ultimately poison our life if it, if it keeps us from the shepherd. Remember, the shepherd's the one who keeps us safe. The shepherd's the one who takes us through the valley, Amen. Okay, I want to make sure you're with me today, because I'm going to need you here in a little while. And so God, in his goodness, if we will allow him, will go ahead of us, and he'll begin removing the things that that will trip us up, the things that could poison us. And I can look back at my life and see the way that God has done this. And sometimes it's through discipline. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes he he makes me do things that I don't want to do, and then I'm like, oh, I see, that was going to kill me. Oh, cool, thanks for being there for me. I'm an idiot, right? Like we have those moments where it's like, oh, oh, you're God and you know everything. Okay, I thought I did for a little while, but maybe I don't. The next thing that the shepherd will do is he'll go ahead and he'll look for tracks. He'll look for um, droppings. He'll look for all kinds of predatory uh, animal behavior in the area to see what he's going to be dealing with, right? He needed to protect his sheep from the things that will be attacking. And obviously, we see a correlation in, in our world and in our life that God does this without us even knowing. And Philip Keller talking about being a shepherd, he talks about the cougars and the mountain lions. And they killed tons and tons. As a matter of fact, he talks about one time when I think there was 40-something, he woke up and 40-something of his sheep had been murdered by cougars or mountain lions. And he said, in all my years of doing this, not one time did I ever see a cougar or mountain lion. Not one time, killing all the animals that they did of his, not one time did he see the cougar or the mountain lion. And so when he talks about the shepherd going ahead of him, this is what he says. It's the things that we don't see. 
Remember we talked about this, that, that our, our, our fight's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the darkness, against the, the spiritual realm that we can't even see. And so what he says is that the sheep better be staying as close as they possibly can to the shepherd because they can't even see the danger that's lurking. But when that shepherd's there with his staff and nowadays with the rifle that they carry, that's the most protected they're ever going to be when they're the closest they can possibly be to the shepherd because they don't know where the, the attack's coming from. And it's so true in our own lives that, that we can be gliding along thinking things are amazing and out of nowhere, boom, something we never saw coming, something we never expected. And we could, we could go chair by chair today, pass a mic, and you could tell me about those moments in your life because I guarantee you every single person's had them. It's the unexpected. It's the unknown. It's things that we can't control. And, and it would be foolish for us to think that we can defend ourselves. It would be foolish for sheep to think, I don't really need the shepherd around because I got this right? I'm going to, my tiny leg will somehow like kick up and, and kill a cougar. Like that, that would be crazy, right? Who, what kind of sheep would do that? We'd be like, you're the dumbest, but us, right? I got this. I can handle this. I don't need, I don't need people. I don't need God. I, I can handle the situation. No, it's the shepherd that can handle it. As a matter of fact, Philip Keller says that the, the, the sheep that he lost the most were the ones that wandered away, the ones that were furthest away that he couldn't get to in time. Those are the ones that, that got overtaken by the predators. So a good shepherd will go ahead and he'll see, you know, what kind of animals am I dealing with here? What kind of predators are, are here? Let me get this thing ready so that when my sheep are there, they're safe with me. And God and his goodness protects us. The third thing that I see that, that a shepherd does is he goes ahead to all the watering holes and he cleans them out to get them ready. He gets the debris out. He gets the junk out. He gets all the things out that, that would get in the way of having fresh water, of having that healthy nourishment for our life. And I love the picture of this being Jesus. That God in his goodness, in our brokenness as man, in our sin as man, went ahead of us with Jesus to, to get rid of the debris, to get things out of the way so that ultimately we could have the nourishment of a relationship with God. And, and I know, especially here in America, we hear the story of Jesus. We know about him. We, you know, we, we celebrate Christmas. We do all these things. Like, we know Jesus. And I think sometimes because of that, it's lost on us who Jesus was and what he did for us. That he went before us so that we could have a, he went and did something that we could never do. That he was fully man, experienced the full pain of crucifixion, experienced the, the full pain of rejection and loss and brokenness and all of these things that we experience. Our good shepherd already went through that for us and lived in perfection. In Easter, um, we always read from Isaiah. And it's such a beautiful passage, and we talk about what Jesus did for us. But I want to read, I want to read all of Psalm 50, or Isaiah 53 today because I want us to remember the, our good shepherd going before us and what he did. It says this, Who has believed our message? To whom has the, the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract to us. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal when he was put in a rich man's grave. 
But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of experience, his experience, my righteous servant will, be, will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Such a beautiful picture of what Jesus did, the pain that he went through so we can experience freedom. And sometimes I think that we forget that God in his goodness, seeing us lost and straying like foolish sheep, instead of leaving us to that to be attacked, sent his son. God himself came to earth as a baby to experience all the pains that we would ever go through to defeat death and sin and the grave and fear and all of these things that we were going to deal with. They laid on him so that we could be free. See, even the disciples didn't understand what was going on when Jesus was being crucified. How could this, how could Jesus dying on a cross be a good thing? They scattered. It's over. They went back to fishing. They went back and did their, how in the world could good come out of this? I thought that he was the Messiah. I thought that he was good. I thought that, that, that God was going to do something with this. But here he is on the cross. And he's dead. Game over. No, God was going before to create a plan for you and for me 2,000 years later. And Jesus was that plan. And out of his pain and anguish came our good. Our good shepherd understands what we're going through. He understands every single thing that we walk through in this life. And because of that, we can trust him. There's not another religion, there's not another God who has come to us to walk with us through the mess to save us from ourselves. Christianity stands alone in that. So I was reading through this and, and, and praying about God, God, what give me a, a picture of like what, what are we talking about here? What's an what's an illustration of what we're talking about? And he, he brought me back to some some things that, that happened over the last few years and, and just the exempt, existence of simple church, why we're even here because of the pain that, that my family and I walked through. But he, he brought to mind, you guys remember the dot to dot where you had the numbers and you just kind of, you know, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. That's all I know you're with me, so I don't have to explain it too much. Okay, so it's dot to dot, right? And so life to me is kind of like a dot to dot. And when, when you're young, it kind of kind of looks like this right here, right? Like, man, I got this, God. Like, bro, I know what that is before you even tell me. Like, I don't need someone walking through. Like, I can do this on my own. Easy dot to dot, right? But then you get a little bit older. <laughs> you walk through some stuff, right? Oh, this is a little tougher than I thought. Life begins to look like this. Okay, I, I can still kind of tell. It's not turned the way that I think that it should be. I don't know if it's a, a, a horse with an ice cream cone on its head or is that a unit? Like, this is how life becomes. Like, I, 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 I know enough. I'm getting smart enough. These are the teenage years into our 20s, maybe 30s, if we don't wake up too quick. And we're like, I kind of know what's going on. Like, I don't really need a whole lot of help. I got to figure it out. It's some kind of a magical creature, I'm pretty sure. Maybe a Pegasus. I don't really know. Right, right, right. We, we got it figured out pretty much. And then life gets hard. Life gets real. And you walk through things you never expected to walk through. And we realize that life looks more like this. How many, of you, how many of you feel that right now? This is how life looks, man. 673 dots. You know why? Because I counted them and I did, it. I did this last night. <laughs> and it was, hold on. It's the best part. Let me tell you this. Even with having the numbers, it was difficult for me to find every one. Here's what I'm so glad that when I see this with my life, God sees this. He sees the lighthouse. I'm so glad that I serve a God that sees this when my life feels like chaos. 
not only is he the one who sees the picture, but he's the dot connector. If, if we'll let him be. If we'll trust him with that. You can try to connect the dots on your own. But let me tell you this. Go, go back to the picture before that. It was difficult with the numbers. When we walk through life, we don't have numbers. Connect those dots without numbers, right? That's what it's like when we try to do this on our own. When, when I walk around and I see people that are, that are angry and frustrated and, and maybe even lashing out at God, what I see are a bunch of people with dot to dots, no numbers, no one to connect them, nothing to make sense of. So I go from dot to dot to dot trying to find something to make me happy trying to make this picture make sense. God, why, if there's a good God, then why, why, why is this? And why, why am I here? And what is this? Why is this happening? Why did this happen to us? And it's maddening. It's maddening. Imagine trying to do that dot to dot with no numbers. It, it would be maddening. Yet so many people live life like that when the truth is that we have a God that sees the whole picture. It makes me think of the story of Joseph, and we, we've covered that story a lot, but, but there couldn't be a better picture of God connecting the dots in, in ways that we never saw. And I love Joseph's faith, and I, I believe that he was a very faithful person. That's why God chose him. But I guarantee you, when he's sitting in the bottom of that well and his brothers have left him there to die, he was not connecting the dots to where he would be later. I promise you. The only thing he had was faith in his God. And some of you are here today, and let's be honest, you're, tr you're trying to figure out how to connect these dots. How is this going to go together? What is this picture? So Joseph, he gets out of the well, and so here's dot one to dot two to dot three, and now here I am in Egypt. And I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Okay, I'm starting to see the picture. I see why you did this, God. Wrongfully thrown in prison now. <laughs> I don't know, again... I think Joseph had a lot more faith than me. I would have been like, what the heck, God? We, we, we connected some dots here. We already did this one time. I was in a well for no reason. I didn't do anything. Now I'm in prison for no reason? You're not real, God. That's the only thing that I can think of. If I'm going through this, then obviously you can't be a good God. And God, in his miraculous ways, begins to connect the dots and connects the dots and connects the dots. Joseph is, is pulled out of prison, and, and he's now second in command of Egypt. And because of his faithfulness, because of his trust that God was connecting the dots and not him, even though he couldn't see the picture, the entire Israel, Israelite nation is saved through him. Joseph could not have connected those dots at the beginning. All he could do was trust that the, the dot connector was at work. And I'm telling you, in my life, as old as I am now, you know, I'm, I'm another year older today, right? I'm finally, I'm done asking why. It's a, it's a purposeless question. I either trust that God is connecting the dots and he's going to bring a beautiful picture out of it, or I need to reject all this and I need to go do my own thing and try to figure out the dots on my own. I'm done asking why. The question I want to ask is what? What do you want me to do with this, God? What step do you want me to take from here? What, what do you want me to learn from this so that I can help other people? Now, is that my first thought when I walk through junk? Oh, goody. Like, let's see what fun's going to come from this. Let's skip along, shepherd. You know, like, that's not me. There's that human moment of why? <laughs> why me? Why are we doing this? Nancy Kerrigan, right? Like, why me? <laughs> I love people my age. Like, yeah, you get me. You understand what I'm saying. It's a purposeless question. What, God? What do you want to learn from this? What do, you, what, do you, what do you want to teach me so that I can help others? What, what do you want to show me so that I can build my faith again? What step do you want me to take? We're, we're on step 372. Just show me 373. That's all I'm asking. When we... Um, I was at my church before the Solace Church, and, and many of you are from there and, and know the journey that we went on there. And I will forever hold in my heart some, some very great things from that church. And uh, we were at a funeral there just uh, last week and uh, got to walk around the building. And just, I felt a peace. I felt a calmness that I haven't felt in a long time there. And so 
Uh, it was a very difficult journey. Uh, we walked through a difficult season. This was in, started in, in 2017, and, um, and it, was, it was just tough. Everything that, that I thought I was going to be there for the rest of my life, my family was going to be there, all my kids and their friends went to, together there, and it just got, the rug just got swept out from underneath us. And, and a lot of you know that story, and I'm not going to jump too much into the details, but um, we went through some issues with our pastor, and, and it just got worse and worse, and, and uh, it happened to be my spiritual father and mentor that, that was the pastor, and so there was a lot of damage to our relationship, and we continued on the journey of trying to, to save the church, and, and uh, I was interim pastor for a while, and that was a great experience, and then once again, the rug kind of got swept out from underneath us, and, and everything happened a different way, and I, in my younger years, asked a lot why led to the first panic attacks I've ever had in my life. I used to make fun of people that had panic attacks. I used to tell them to get over it <laughs> until I experienced it. And it left me at a place where I was utterly confused on why anything had happened in my life. God, I'm a, I'm a pastor. Like, I chose to try to serve you with my life. How could you let this happen to me? Like, why, why is everything broken? And during that time, my mom had been diagnosed with MSA, and we knew that it was going to be fatal at some point. And I just got to a place in, in 2019 where I was just done. I was done with, you know, my faith was there, but I was done with ministry. I was done with, with people. <laughs> I was just done. And I just began to pray to God, why? 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 And he finally told me, you don't get to know. And that was hard to hear. And I took a, uh, my students on, I was back in youth ministry, and I took the students on a, a mission trip. And I've told this story before, but there, there's, I know there's a lot of new people here, and I think it's really important to understand what God does. And, and I want to say this, my, my pain's different from your pain, and I would never think that I'm, I'm more or less than anyone else, but this is my, my story. This is my pain that, that I walked through. And I took them on this mission trip, and we went to Mexico, and we're building a house for a family, and we're doing ministry, and, and just, you know, love those moments with those students. And uh, in the morning, we go down to the beach, and you had uh, FaceTime with God, so you just, just you alone with God. And we got down to the beach, and I was still struggling. This was in, in June of 2019. I was still struggling with, with what God was doing, and I felt this urge to, like, start a church, but I was in such a bad place that I just was like, no, nah, I think I'm good. <laughs> I think I'm done with churches. And we're sitting on the beach, and, and I, I just needed something from God. Um, I, you know, was, was really struggling with my mom's disease and just trying to figure out why was all this happening. And so I'm sitting on the beach with my Bible, taking students on this mission trip, and I told God, tell me what to do. You speak to me right now. And I, I said it in that, in my mind, in that tone to him. I'm not proud of that. I'm not saying, but you know what? I also know he's okay with that. He understood what I needed in that moment. I said, speak to me right now. I'm on a mission trip on the beach. There is not a better time for you to speak to me. And I sat there for 30 minutes and nothing. And I was mad. And there was a thousand things going on. There was a dog chasing a ball right in front of me. There was a yoga class or something going on over here. There was a swim instructing class going on out in there. There was 19 different things, people running on the beach. I could not pay attention for four seconds, and I was just mad. God, what the heck? I'm doing what you want me to do. Why? Why would you let me go through this? Why would these relationships be broken? Why would you let me take the blame for things I didn't do that I had no control over? Why? Why is my mom going through this? You tell me why. Nothing. So I got up and I was frustrated. I was distracted by everything going on. And so I walked up. They had this little boardwalk up to the top. And I walked to the very top. And I'm just kind of walking up and down the street a little bit, and I come back to, to where the beach is at, and I stand there. And I look out over the beach, and all these things are still happening, yet it's completely quiet. I can't hear the dog. I can't hear the, the swim lessons. I can't hear the yoga people. But it's all there in this giant picture. And it's in that moment. I'll tell you right now, that's the, that's the beginning of Simple Church right there. It's at that moment that God said, I see this. You're so caught up 
in every little thing that's going on, and all these little distractions in your life, you can't see this. You don't have the capacity to do that. I see this. If you will trust me, I see the other side of this. I know where it's going, but you have to trust me. You have to surrender. I thought I had surrendered in my life. No, God was like, you have to give it all up. You have to give me the outcome. You have to give me the why. You have to give me step number four, five, and six that you're never going to see right now. You have to give me all of that if you, if you truly want this. And in that moment, I committed to God. I surrender all. And that was the beginning of complete change in my life. And not, my life has not been perfect. There's been ups and downs. I've lost more friendships over the years. But I only care about the next step that he asked me to go on. You give me step two, and I'll, I'm going there. What's step three? I have no idea, but I trust the dot connector. What's step 700? I don't want to know. I can't handle that. <laughs> <laughs> what if dot 10? Golly. I'm getting old, man. I'm getting weak in my old age. <clears throat> Well, if dot 10 is your mom doesn't survive, okay, it's up to you. It's been the most freeing thing in my life, and I'm not perfect at it, and I'm not saying I got it all figured out, but I have just, I got to a place to 2019 where it was like, God, I give up. And he said, finally, finally, there's so much freedom in giving up. It's almost like when Jesus said, if you want to gain your life, you have to lose it. He actually meant that. <laughs> like, he actually knew what he was talking about. Like, I'm like, Jesus, you, you're a smart one. You kind of know more than I think you might know. My prayer for everyone who walks through difficult times is that they can surrender the outcome to God. That they have faith in the dot connector, and however he chooses to connect those dots is up to him. Here's what I think is the key to living that kind of life, because it's not easy. It's not easy to, to get that diagnosis. It's not easy to lose that person. We've walked through some very difficult things in this church. There are some people in this church right now who are walking through situations that break my heart. There's another time that the shepherd went ahead to prepare the way for us. Jesus, as he's about to go to the cross, is gathered with his disciples. He says this in John 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't, Lord, Thomas said. We don't know the steps. <laughs> We're not connecting the dots here. We, can, we can't figure this out. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. The only way to live this kind of life of faith is to believe that this is not our final destination. God tells us, Scripture tells us, we're aliens here. We're foreigners. This is not our home. And we, if we live so much that we cling so tightly to the things, things of this world, we will be swallowed up by all the junk that happens in our life. But if we can get to a place where we see that this is not the ultimate paradise for us, this is not the ultimate joy, that there is forever in eternity with our good shepherd, it will fundamentally change the way we feel about the outcome of how things turn out. Do I want my mom here with us? Absolutely. Every day I think about her. Am I glad that she's healed and whole and walking the streets with Jesus? You better believe it. That's so much better. I'm jealous of her. I love the things in this world. I love my family. I love vacations. I, man, I, I, I want to soak up every minute of my time here on earth, but this is not my home. I'm not going to hold tightly to it. I'm holding tightly to Jesus. That's it. 
And if you want to walk that, this, this journey and you want to be free and you want to say, I'm releasing myself from trying to connect these dots, then you have to let go of the things of this world and know that God sees the big picture. But ultimately, our place with him in heaven is so much more important than our time here on earth. Soak it in. Love people well. Enjoy your time here, but realize this is not the end of the story. Don't hold so tightly to the things of this world, but know that the dot connector, the one who sees the big picture, he's in control. He's going ahead of us. He went ahead of us to bring us Jesus. He went ahead of us to prepare a place for us. He is preparing the table before us. We have to put our trust in him. We can't see the things that he's doing, and I'm okay with that, and I hope that you are too. I hope that you can trust him at that level. It's not easy. You're not always going to get it right. But if we believe what he's said and what he's done already, we can trust that he sees the picture and that he's taking us to the next step and the next step and the next step. Just take the step he asks you to take. That's it. That's your job. And the only way to know what step to take is to be as close to the shepherd as you've ever been. And so as we walk through these valleys, as we go through the things that we're going to go through, that's what Jesus told his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled because things are going to get really bad. Be close as you can, as close as you can to the shepherd as you walk through that valley. And he will give you the faith. He'll give you the strength. He'll give you the, even if the outcome, outcome isn't what you want it to be, he will give you the strength to make it through. That's my prayer over you today. Once again, thank you for stopping by today. We'd love for you to be a part of our family at one of our services. You can find out all of our information at simplechurchtulsa.com. And we'd love to pray for you any way we can. So please message us and we hope you have a great week.